welcome to Level 4, the Auto Drive Challenge Podcast. I'm Mike Sorg, the uh, podcast and video producer for the SAE CDS series. Of course, this challenge is going to be a lot about the technology in the car. We want to talk today about the technology that's going to be around the car and help you with scoring and help you through this competition. First of all, here with us in the studio is Amanda Pakarkowski, University Programs Developer with the SAE CDS series. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Excellent. And on the line, uh, joining us from the scoring uh, team for the challenge is Spencer Fowler. Hey, thanks for having me. And Mike Zeman. Howdy. Thanks for joining us, guys. So, uh, Amanda, I know you've been working with these guys on some really cool stuff uh, for year two of this competition. Where, where do we start? Yeah, so the first year of Auto Drive was a challenge for us in the sense that it's the first CDS challenge program that we have launched from scratch in a long, long time. Uh, Baja and Formula are already in there. You know, they've been around for dozens of years. So this was the first opportunity we had to take a rule set at the very beginning and build an entire scoring environment around that. When we think about scoring and auto drive, obviously it makes sense to immediately go to final scores. But in order to get that in a competition that is so technologically driven, it took a lot of uh, testing and really thinking through the entire environment start to finish. How do we get a, a vehicle that's been outfitted with other technology that we don't have access to, capture that car's performance, measure how automated that car is, and then translate that into a numeric value to get it uh, on a website and eventually in a, a scoring spreadsheet. So the first year we really were... Um, relying a lot on processes we've used in the past for other CDS competitions. Uh, we've had some existing technology, the scoring websites and that sort of thing, but measuring uh, four runs in autocross is a lot different than taking <laughs> an autonomous vehicle and figuring out how well it, it performed. So we started from scratch. We um, were able to tap into a lot of the existing infrastructure at the Yuma Proving Grounds. And at that point, it was up to us to, to pull it off. So Mike and Spencer have been working. They worked very hard last year to get everything up and running, and it came down to the wire on a lot of things last year. We were uh, not anticipating some of the issues. You know, you're in the middle of the desert. How do you get technology or how do you get Wi-Fi over mountains and, and connecting a car down a you know, several mile track. Those are the things we were working through at the very end last year. Uh, up until the point of competition, we had rules that we were um, looking at all the way through competition even to see if we were accurately scoring those. But at the end of the day, we made it through. We got our feedback from the surveys and we've spent the last 10 months really diving in on that feedback and figuring out ways that we can make the experience both better for students and score more accurately. Of course, year two brings an additional set of challenges, which is all of a sudden we need more than just a stop, a stop sign on the side of the road and a limit line painted on the ground. We're looking at how do we change the light phases and how do we move a deer out in front of a car and all of these uh, things we've never had to deal with in CDS challenges before. So this team really focused in on that. Spencer has been working very diligently on how we can take the rules and turn that into something that not only is an algorithm that goes through the software once a car has some some data behind it, but how does that get spit out into the website in a usable format? Mike's team has been working really hard on how we can make challenges repeatable and uh, fair for every team. When, we're, when you're doing the same challenge for eight teams, potentially up to 16 different times with reruns, how do you make sure that deer is fairly moving across the, the road at the same speed, at the same time? How, how does all that play into it? So we're still obviously working through a lot of that, and you're going to hear some of the the new possibilities on this podcast. It's an ever-changing environment, I would say. Uh, but 
I figure maybe it makes sense to just start at the beginning of the scoring environment. Uh, this year, we aren't really changing a whole lot about the way cars are being instrumented. Um, we have some changes to how data is being pulled off the car. And Spencer can can start with that a little bit if he wants to go into that. And then we can move on to the individual challenges. Excellent. Well, Spencer, uh, what's going on on your end? Well, we're uh, going based on the feedback from last year, like Amanda said, and really trying to focus on improvements that are going to help the student experience overall. And uh, a couple of those things that uh, caused pain points last year that we want to work on this year are clarifying the student's understanding of rules and also uh, scoring in a little bit quicker fashion to try and and get these results computed faster and, and gotten back to the students. So we've got a new focus on information transparency between the competitors and the scoring team and a focus on the tight coupling between the metrics from the rules and the software algorithm. And we've always had that in the past, but we've streamlined the process that goes from the rule book to what is our new scoring traceability matrix and into the software algorithms. So we've come up with this scoring traceability matrix to release to the teams now. And this is the document we now work from internally as well. And these are the exact parameters that go straight into implementing the scoring system calculations. So what this means is from the rule sets, verbose wording of an explanation of how many points, it it gets copied into the matrix and we refine and refine and we've published the matrix to the teams now so that you guys can see exactly added up all in, in order how many points come from which metrics. And these values are imported all automatically into the scoring system and actually used to calculate each metric based on that code that's on the left side. We're also looking at the concept of a dash indicator system, which can go in the students' vehicles. And we're looking at being able to provide this as a way to give competitors in the vehicle a better understanding in real time of their performance on the course. And it will compute a subset of the scoring algorithms live in the vehicle based on the information it's been programmed with and can display a little bit of info to the people in the car about whether they've uh, received a DNF or anything else that may be concerning uh, to give them a little bit more decision information for if they're going to rerun or not. So that's really exciting. And we're hoping to have those implemented this year. We've uh, also got a new competition venue this year that allows a lot more flexibility. And some of the things that we're able to do on it, uh, we've got better network connectivity around the site. Amanda mentioned earlier that we had some uh, big technical challenges last year about getting uh, wireless around a three-mile stretch of desert with mountains in the middle. And so that was absolutely a huge challenge. And this year, with our increased network capacity, we're able to stream a little bit more of the scoring data live back to the scoring trailer, which means we can do a little bit more of the computation live remotely as well. And this is going to allow for a shorter time between each run for post-processing, overall streamlining the entire process. So we're really excited about these upcoming changes, and we're really focused on getting these systems implemented really well. Our last big focus on the scoring system this year is how the data actually gets stored after the scores have been computed for a specific run. And we've really focused on innovating and coming up with a better standard for this data. And now the way the data gets aggregated can be transferred over to the website very easily and provide a lot more contextual information about each metric and uh, the points awarded and why they were awarded or, or taken away. This is going to allow a lot more flexibility on the website end for display of information. But I'll let Mike talk a little bit more about that. Great. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, we're really excited about all the changes that you've made on your side with the processing and the algorithms. And we're excited to be able to take more detail and show it to the teams on the results portal. So for the teams that used the results portal last year, the easiest way to get to it is using the link in the AutoDrive Challenge app. Now, we understand that the first year there were some difficulties with getting on the network or maybe bringing your cell phone on site, and a lot of people didn't use the app or didn't use their phone on site. But I'd really like to encourage you to reconsider that this year. There's excellent LTE coverage at MCity, and you'll you'll be able to use your phone 
throughout the entire competition. So if you guys don't have the Auto Drive Challenge app, go download it today. It's in the app stores. And that will allow you to tap into news feed and push notifications and all sorts of good stuff uh, and acts as a good launch pad for getting you into the other areas of the competition where we're posting information, such as the live results. So from the app, you can get to the live results page and you can see some information about each team's challenges and their runs that they ran. One of the new things that you'll notice this year is for each one of your runs, you'll be able to see each metric that was scored, traced right back to the traceability matrix, and you can see that metric name and the number of points that you were awarded for that metric. So if it was something where you earned points, you can see exactly how many points you earned and why. Uh, you can see the maximum number of points that you could have earned for that particular metric. And if it's a penalty, you can see how many points you were penalized and what was the maximum penalty you might have incurred for that particular metric. So there's a lot more detail on every single part of what was scored. And that's all the work that Spencer has done to pass that detail along to me on the website allows me to serve it up to you guys and show it to you in a much easier to understand way. So we really encourage you to take a fresh look at the results portal website and we expect to be able to have your data to you much sooner than in year one. And finally, on the results portal, you'll have the opportunity to, to send us a problem report if you notice anything strange or possibly incorrect about your results. And we encourage you to do that. The problem reports will be accepted for each challenge through the end of that day. So get on there, review your results as they're coming in. They should be there much sooner. And let us know if you notice any problems, and we'll, we'll conduct a review and get in touch with you. That tells you guys how we go from collecting the data on your cars, your performance, to getting it on the website. But this year's challenges are really unique in that there's a lot more environmental effect on your run. So we're, we have pedestrians crossing the road. We have deer crossing the road. We have light changes. We have um, a pretty small compact area, but the amount of course we're covering for each one of these dynamic events is actually pretty big. Um, earlier, Spencer mentioned that we're working with M-City now, and it's been a really cool experience working with M-City. It's a very, very well-connected environment, and there's lots and lots of uh, tools and equipment that we can tap into that we didn't have access to last year. So I want to go through each challenge one by one, see if there's anything interesting. Um, I know you guys don't know about the challenges, but uh, we sent out some rules clarification. So maybe we can just address those each um, kind of at a high level as we move through each challenge. The first challenge is the um, traffic control challenge. Not a whole lot of technology in this one. Uh, you're, you're mostly just moving off the signs in, in the environment. The one thing that did change about this is that we gave you a little bit more wiggle room on your parking space. So once you pull into your parking space, uh, it's, it actually will, will be a bigger um, footprint that you'll be able to get your car into. Uh, that was one of the things we chose to err on the side of you guys to make sure that it was a fair assessment whenever we go to, to actually match up your uh, data versus the line data. So that was something that came out of one of our recent testing trips. Um, anything else on the traffic control challenge? Oh, I'd say it's a good start to getting ramping up for the rest of the week. So there, you know, it's mostly signage, right? Signage and navigation. Yeah. So that one's a pretty simple challenge. Then we move on to, well, let's talk about the intersection challenge. Mike, how did your team approach the intersection challenge in conjunction with M city. Well, it was, it was kind of a cool experience for us too, because uh, we've never had a, a programming challenge quite like that. So we've done a lot of work with M city. We've interfaced with their API for control, controlling and orchestrating the, all the traffic lights that are in M city. And so we've also developed a couple of ways where we can tell where the car is. And so we know when the car gets to the right spot and we can decide when to, uh, give you a green light or give you a red light based on that. And there are a whole lot of turns and a nice little course that you get to, uh, to navigate. And we're going to be behind the scenes, uh, 
pulling all the strings and making all that happen in a consistent and repeatable way. So we're really excited to see how that goes. The intersection challenge was a software challenge for you guys. Uh, a little bit different whenever we're moving people across the road. That's right. Uh, it, the year has been full of challenges for all of us, hasn't it? So it's uh, we're right there with you. And uh, as the competition is evolving and your vehicles are evolving, our I guess hardware portfolio, software portfolio is evolving as well. So we have added a uh, a special way to get the pedestrian across the the road. And we're controlling that at the right time based on things like the car's position and speed and other things like that. So really trying to make sure that everybody gets a fair shot at this. We want it to be as close as possible for all the different runs so that uh, everyone experiences the same challenge. And that's how we can get a good level playing field for, for the scoring. One of the challenges we faced with trying to get the pedestrian to cross the road was we wanted to do it in a way such that we would minimize our impact on the autonomous sensing systems of the of the car. So we didn't want to have some weird track in the ground that we're pulling a rope across or something like that that you might pull up to and think is a line. Uh, we didn't. There were a couple of different approaches to this that we went through, and we ended up with something that doesn't alter the course at all, and will basically drive itself out in front. So a small platform that itself is autonomous to some degree and is programmable and controllable by our event software on the other end. So we're going to send the pedestrian out when it needs to go out. It's going to follow the exact same path every time. And and we've been doing a lot of testing to make sure that that's repeatable and fair. Okay, next up was is finally the M-City Challenge. This is kind of a culminating event where we're trying to add in all the different pieces that we have been scoring you guys on throughout the rest of the week and it brings it into one big challenge. So you're going to see some light changes. You're going to see some, some objects and dynamically moving in the road. You're going to see some railroad crossings. And when we visited um city last year, the railroad crossing actually wasn't installed. So this was a challenge that we were, uh, on the fence about including in the rule set but we we had a promise from m-city that it was going to happen and it, it certainly is happening we were able to see it at one of our test weekends um in action and it's really a pretty cool uh situation so i you want to talk a little bit about about that one mike Sure. Uh, like you said, it's it's kind of a good cocktail of all the different challenges, elements of all the different challenges that we've run into in the previous challenge, uh, in the previous auto drive challenges from the week. So, of course, one of the things that uh, that I think a lot of people think about when they think about autonomous cars is, well, how will it deal with unexpected situations? And I know you guys have spent a lot of time thinking about that. So we're excited to be able to exercise that in EM City Challenge. Uh, there will be an unexpected situation that in that unfolds where there is something in the in the road, and the car will have to deal with it. So uh, excited to see how that plays out. One of the other neat features of the M City Challenge course is that it involves um, a tunnel, and the tunnel has some really as simple as it sounds. It has a pretty profound impact on lots of different things, including your navigation and our data collection and everything. So. Um, you want to tell us a little more about that? This was one of the situations that we spent a lot of time at our very first test weekend this year. Uh, we focused a lot on making sure that we could get data out of the tunnel in a way that we could use. Spencer, you were involved on that team uh, testing some of that out. That's right, Amanda. We'd spent a lot of time making sure that we could really reliably track the vehicle's uh, position solution through the tunnel. And uh, that becomes a little bit difficult when it's a tunnel that's literally built to be GPS occluded. So we focused a lot on monitoring the output of the innovations of the extended Kalman filter that's running in the data collection box provided by OXTS and comparing it to other truthing systems as well. And we found our uh, position accuracies to be really, really close all the way through to the out of output of the tunnel up until 
the point that the car could literally stop in the middle of the tunnel for a couple of minutes and keep driving. And we still knew exactly where the car was within a couple of centimeters by the time it exited. So we're really happy to see the OXTS system's performance on that. And we're excited to be able to uh, continue our scoring through the tunnel and after the tunnel as you start to approach additional parts of the challenge that will need accurate GPS positioning. Yeah, so we did our part on the tunnel. Now you guys have to do yours and make sure you can actually get through the tunnel with your your uh, systems. We start out, we write a rule set last summer, and then we have to incorporate some dynamic challenges into that rule set, <laughs> incorporate that rule set into the dynamic challenges, I guess. And it, it can always be a challenge. So we really have spent the last few months figuring out how to make the on-site challenges right and then modified the rules or provided clarifications accordingly. So a couple of weeks ago, we published some scoring clarifications, a new set of rules. Please make sure you guys go back and review those documents. There's a ton of information in there. We really worked hard to ensure that you're able to understand how we're scoring you. We understand how important it is for you guys to, to be able to perform well in this competition and understand why you're getting the scores you're getting. Spence already mentioned that we worked really hard on making the traceability matrix a thing so that you guys can see what's behind the scenes, behind the curtains. And we have some more documents coming in the uh, near future that are I know are going to be a hot topic. We had several questions at the kickoff event asking about the jerk and drivability metrics, that sort of thing. These are kind of, you know, they feel very up in the air, but Spencer has spent a long time um, Spencer spent a long time trying to figure out how to make these both measure what, what we're looking to measure, but also make them a fair, uh, metric for a team. So uh, Spencer, do you want to talk a little bit about that? The jerk in drivability metrics? So the way we've approached this solution really focuses on being able to calculate acceleration gradient or jerk. Uh, using sensors that, that have a pretty high amount of noise in them and still be a fair calculation and something close to what you're going to see from the performance of our IMU. And we're publishing a bit of information about this on how students can calculate their own uh, jerk values in real time or in post-process and giving the students a little bit better understanding of exactly the filtering we put the IMU data through before we actually look for those bounds where you exceed the uh, metric. So this should give everybody a little bit better understanding of what actually goes into this. As you can all hear, we've spent uh, some, some pretty serious time thinking about how to make this competition feel better and, and provide as much information as we possibly can to you. Both Mike and Spencer are former student competitors in other series, and they've worked really hard to make sure that the student experience is just as important as getting accurate uh, data out of the the technology. So please, if you have any questions about the things that you're seeing in the documents, send them in on the rules Q&A. Make sure you're reading the FAQs. All of these documents are, are meant to help you be more informed about your, what you're going to see at competition, as well as make uh, inform your engineering design choices. So that's all I've got on my end. Uh, either Mike, do you have anything to add? Nope. I don't, I don't think so. We're excited to see you guys for a year or two and looking forward to all the challenges. Nope. That's it. I think we covered everything that we wanted to talk about here. All right. We'll see you in Ann Arbor. Thank you for listening to level four, the SAE auto drive challenge podcast. Make sure you download our app on your smartphone for updates and contact information. The show notes for this episode and all others can be found at autodrive.fireside.fm.